Aloha Aina, and welcome to Voices of Truth, one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future, brought to you by the Kauai Foundation. I'm Ehuke Kahu Cardwell, and here we are today at Kamaka Kuokulani, the Center for Hawaiian Studies at the University of Hawaii on the island of Oahu. And we're continuing our never-ending search of what it takes to turn armchair observers into active participants to create a better future for Hawaii. So if you're curious like we are, come on along with us, as we're very privileged to have a very special guest with us on the show today, none other than Kumujan Keola Lake. Aloha. Welcome. Aloha, my name. <laughs> uh, it's so great to have you on the show, Kumu. We wanted to have you on here for a long time. Oh, thank you. And I want to say right off the bat that I consider you, as well as many other people, one of Hawaii's living treasures today. Thank you. Your, your, what you've done for our, the people and the culture of Hawaii has been phenomenal. I want to go back to when it all started for you. I know you were raised from a very young child. You told mm -hmm. me, oh, maybe a year ago we were talking about this. You were that's raised right. by the Wahines, the women in your in yeah, your family. That's pretty much that's the truth. Yeah. Oh wait. You know what? You asked and made a statement right there about. Uh, how to get involved in it, you know, and this is what sort of turned around what my kulian was. Yeah. And um, I was away at, at teaching in California. Really? And when, yeah. And when I returned in around 1962, I was a lot of the, uh, they were looking for local teachers to come back home to teach, you know, and this was at St. Louis, at the time St. Louis College. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, I'll come back. Well, like, my area was political science and history classes and Spanish. Spanish? Definitely. <laughs> definitely. And, well, I, 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 in 1963, uh, I was teaching, I had the chance to meet a wonderful uh, nun by the name of Sister Jean Louise. She was a parish girl from uh, Kaimuki, mm -hmm. a nun of the Sacred Hearts Order. And she says, You know, Kioni, and she, it was very odd, she called me Kioni, she said, what do you think about thinking about teaching Hawaiian language? Wow. And I said, Hawaiian language? She said, yeah. She says, because it should be taught. It used to be required. I mean, that was the first language of land, and it should be brought back. Well, with, through that, and I started thinking I was introduced to Dorothy Kahnanui. This is back in 1963. And sort of, sort of uh, ideas got started, and, uh, and, I, and I kept thinking to myself, Gee, that's my native tongue. That's what I grew up speaking. This is what I grew up hearing my grandparents and both my father's parents and my uh, my grandmother raised me in Lahaina. And so I said, why not? And really that's where the inspiration. So by 1964, I opened history, Hawaiian history classes. Then, yeah, at the end of the fall of 64, I opened Hawaiian language class. And that's all at St. Louis. Kamehameha School was, had started also in 63 mm. and teaching language. Then it started to move and blossom and look where it is today. We have immersion schools, charter schools, yes. and Punana Leo, and we have so many young generations that are, the older generations who couldn't speak have to go and take a while so they can understand their grandchildren. <laughs> the more opuna. But it really started when I was a young child, which I had, I had, <laughs> No direction as to saying, I, I'd like, I want to do this. It was, no, you come and you do this. Mm. Um, I was born in Wailuku, Maui, but I was raised most of the early part of my life in the mid-30s up to, into the 40s in Lahaina by a beautiful lady by the name of Abigail Paukamakani Kamana Oloko Okalani Kaluakini. And she was a gracious lady. She was... Um, uh, who made sure that we we did our family prayers and our chores on automatic and everything else, but would always share s stories, the mo'olelo of our kupuna, and that was the most beautiful thing of all. But she was the one who introduced me to my uh, my grand aunt, and for some reason she says, no, you come with me. And unbeknownst to my sisters and cousins, I was taken down this long road roll down to Kaehukai Kai's home and then I'd listen and you know the the old adage, you know, Pakawaha, Rohimakapiao, mouth closed, listen with your ears, yes. observe. Yes. Okay, so that's what I've done. 
I'm doing, and all of a sudden I'm dancing in the sand, and I'm listening, and I'm mimicking prayers, I'm mimicking chants, and everything else. And this is when I kept going, gee, till about 12. 12 years in old. In and out, yeah. And wow. yet I, I had moved back to live with my, my folks by the time, or literally by five, but every time I went back, I stayed with my grandmother. That was it. And you'd learn a little more. A little more and everything else. And never questioning because it was, you know, hard and possible. You, all right, all right, me. And so, okay, did that. But moving back to Wailuku to live with my mother, my mother was Kaloha Luakini, and had married uh, John Matthew Lake, you know, a good old tall six foot three and a half Hawaiian. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let the name John Lake just you know, throw you off, but he was. My, guess my, my, <clears throat> his grandmother, they were pure Hawaiian. Hmm. His mother was street potters Hawaiian. And his father was three quarters Hawaiian. Wow. And so you got this gigantic Hawaiian guy, you know. Yeah, the the, the na family name Lake goes way back in oh. in uh in historically uh, Hawa yeah. yeah, Hawaiian yeah. genealogy. Yeah. 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 Surprising yeah. enough we did, but yeah. That, that's another story. Yes. Crossing lines. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, So you began to pick this stuff up and learn it bit by bit. It was, well, I was speaking Hawaiian. Yeah. yeah I was the only one speaking Hawaiian yeah. and everything else because hey, that was the conversation I heard. Yeah. And when I returned home to live with my, my father of them, my, my dad, it says, in this house we speak, we speak English. This is only English. You know, wow. You go to school, you're going to learn English and everything else. And, you know, it was the idea that's the only way you can get ahead. Mm -hmm. And yet, my grandmother, my tutu, my tutu Kani and tutu Ahini Lakes, she, they only spoke Hawaiian. My grandfather, my Tutukani, could speak English, yeah, very well. And he was a politician. He was also a surveyor. And he was like six foot eight. Oh, wow. Big Hawaiian guy. Wow. You know? And, um, but at home, everything was done in Hawaiian. So there was a benefit to it because every time my sisters and cousins would come over, they would say, oh, here, go, get those tutu. She's ranting, blah, She's ranting and she's scolding. And I would just say, yeah. <laughs> they met with you, and of course, but she would be asking is, can someone come outside and go pick the mango for tutu, you know, and, and I would all, hickey, okay, hey, you know, and different things, but uh, I guess I, you never question all the things, Our, and moving back to Wailuku, where in Lahaina I was raised to enjoy the sea, we did the gathering at the Limu, the, the Limu Koho, the, the leaf poor, the ele ele, and catching fish and going down and picking up one love of opelu for my grandmother and everything, all of this. Come back to Maui, to Hailu, I should say, and it's working in the tar patches. So mm -hmm. this is perfect. We had 12, 12 to 16 tar patches in the back of our house in Wailuku town. This is in the 1940s, you know, and and we had we had the responsibility of nurturing them. Mm -hmm. okay, and every, Every week it was rotate with one grandchild to, to get up in the morning to let the waters in to flow down from the tower patches. And when you ho eat from school, come back from school, your job was okay, you gotta feed the pigs, you gotta make sure that all the, <clears throat> the, the hoodie has been placed on the side so that they can be replanted. Mm -hmm. And then each household would bring their kinei of big poi bowl because. My father and uncle and my grandfather would be on the poi board pounding poi. This is before Tara Brand and all this. You know. So when did you know you wanted to become a teacher? I, well, I was influenced pretty. Um, when I was at the University of Hawaii, I was going to go into speech pathology and I said, nah, and everything else. I said, no, I think my calling is education because my uncle was a good teacher. And I loved him. I believe Kaluaki, my mother's father. And he had an influence on him too. And I said, I like working with kids. I like working with people and that. Mm -hmm. So I decided to uh, leave U University of Hawaii and I went to University of San Francisco, of course, couldn't, didn't do any foreign language learning because University of Hawaii, the only two classes they had was uh, the Reverend Keale and Keala's. Reverend Kahale and uh, Reverend Samuel Keala. 
and it, like they were beginner's classes. That's the only Hawaiian yeah. they ever had. Yeah, you know, yeah. and and, and look, I, I'll never forget the <laughs> kahukal I would say. Why are you looking at me? Why look at my ear? Why are you in disguise? He said, the credit. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> and then it became a task, and then we found that the the young men. This is in the '60s, okay, wow. and that wasn't you know you didn't have your great Renaissance yet. Yeah, not much cultural no, awareness going on no back culture. in the '60s. In fact, when I was teaching Hawaiian history, and I was trying, there was high, you know talking about audiovisual aids, it was like zero. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I think there were only six, eight slides at Bishop Museum. <laughs> you could wow. find at that time. Wow. So it was it became part and parcel well, if sixty before I started teaching Hawaiian language and Hawaiian history, sixty five the young men of the football team they asked me says, and of course when I came back in the in the early sixties I reunited with my Hanai brother, which is Kahuanole. Mm-hmm. He's my first cousin, but as a child, his father gave him to my father to raise, you know, and so all of a sudden he became the older brother. Everybody had to shift down in position. Yes. But then I got introduced to Auntie Mikey Ayu, and then, oh, I took a pull again in the early 60s, so we were dancing with her in 63, etc. So by 65, the fall of 65, after the football season, the football boys in St. Louis came and asked me, who? Oh, we like dance. He said, what do you mean you like dance? Oh, we like to learn Hawaiian songs, we like to play music, and we like to dance hula. And I said, you're kidding. You died. And he said, no, no. <laughs> and all 45 of them. Came. Wow. The 45 boys came up. Forty-five football he, the, the, players. The football players came up and said, "No, we're interested." I said, "Okay." They all showed up, and then they, I said, "Well," and I'm thinking to myself, "How am I going to get out of here? You go look for forty-five girls. That was the easiest task for them to do." <laughs> <laughs> so we did, and as a result, at sixty-five into sixty-six. We developed what was, what was called the Hawaiian mixed chorus and dancers. Wow! So this is how it all started for you, is yeah. it? As a yeah. as a kumu, as a teacher of of hula. Yeah, I was in. I was still a student. Of yeah, hula, you know, and then and I was Isn't just a, a regular kumu teaching. Yeah. I was a kumu paniolo. <laughs> you know, and kumu uh, in the making. Yeah, kumu in the making, yeah. and then um, and so we, we got started, and then by sixty six. Sixty-seven, and to Mikey asked us uh, how many of us would wanted to become part of her uh, first kumuhula that she was planning to graduate mm. and train. And of course, being that I was dancing with her throughout the early sixties, there were three of us dancers, and uh, I said sure, and became part and parcel. So, besides teaching school, correcting papers at night, I also spent four hours. You know, it's not either performing or. <laughs> uh, uh, Working as a maitre d for my cousin Kahuano, and then, then dancing and then taking classes for Kumuhula. But at the same time, of course, we got the language going because by 67, 68, language was being taught at Keokaha. All of a sudden, Kailua High, uh, High School introduced with Lokomaika is Snake and Word. So at this point, it was beginning to it take. It was beginning to grow. To grow, definitely. yes. And then you had a, a a department, so to speak, of Hawaiian language and Hawaiian history mm-hmm. taking shape mm-hmm. at UH here, you know. Yep. And by 68, 69, we began, well, two things that started the first part of the year. A group that was known as Hui Imi Na'awa'u, which was made up of, because besides Hawaiian language, the next question was, why isn't culture and history taught? Yes. Because it wasn't required, and yes. nothing was taught. The only places that had any kind of cultural activity were the old summer school programs, mm. the, in the Paki Park, the recreation, oh, wow. you know, those. And so we got together with the, the, the park directors that had, uh, like, Uncle George Holokai, mm-hmm. and 
and we got together and we formerly was called Ui Minawa'u under the, uh, the leadership of Dr. Hiloloni Mitchell, hmm. Donald Mitchell from MA School. Wow. And that became the, the venue for all teachers in social studies and Pakwa to get together. Then we, we saw the fish cross the issues and just came together so that by 72, UH was boiling. Yep. Hilo was boiling already yep. too, and then you know, by the 76, boom, it became. It took off and grew. Language was required, Hawaiian yep. language, and Hawaiian studies. Yeah, wonderful. Oh, well, it had to be offered in fourth, seventh, and eleventh grade. Wonderful. When did you uh, start your own halal? Well, my home halal in regards to, oh, as opposed to the, the high school, and because this year the, the high school one celebrates 40 years, 55. Oh wow. Know? That's incredible. That is, I, when he, yeah, I yeah. started, well, this is how I got started. Um, we were supposed to graduate from the first my, uh, hula class, my hula sisters, in 1972. But in 1972, my young men and women that I started with 45, okay? The football players. The football players. Yes. We started to grow because we had outstanding musicians like George Helm and Sidney yes. Sakuya and every many rock, Bobby Hall. They became well-known singers, you know, and as well as dancers. That by 1970, 71, 72, you were a BMOC, big man on campus, if you played football and was in the Hawaiian club. <laughs> or by 1960, 1969, Mama Pukui, Mary Pukui, gave yeah. me the name and says, Look, you're right. you should call, call your kids Hui or Naupio, the gathering of young people. Mm -hmm. And it's been like that ever since. Mm -hmm. so, so that was the first group. Then in 1975, or actually 74, the end of 74, George Kamehele, mm -hmm. the late George Kamehele. Yep. He asked me, hey, John, we got to put together, we got to get Hawaii music going. I know you're teaching choral music with your students up here, because by that time I had 385 students. 385? Yep. Whoa. Hey, that was, you had to be big man on campus. Whoa. And every girl from all the three schools, St. Francis, Dodd, C. Cigarat, they were there. Marino was trying to come in too, <laughs> you know, just to be part of it. Right? So this thing really caught it grew. on fire. It, it became, it, it, it really took off, and and our boys were no longer, they're not shy dancing in public. I mean, mm -hmm. it became a very manly thing to dance. Sure. Ooh. Okay. Um, so that, by, you know, 1975, George said, let's start a program. Well, we'll co-sponsor of St. Louis will give us an, uh, the school at night, we'll pay for the expenses, we'll pay for the teaching and everything. You go get the teachers. So I did. And that was the birth of Halau Mele, mm. which I have, my Halau is called that today, Halau Mele. Mm. And that went all the way up to the 80s. And we had, oh, Danny, we had Auntie Edith teaching chant every wow. four, three or four seasons. And Alice Namaki Elua come in and teaching her tutu slacky at age 87. Wow. You know? And, <laughs> and we, yeah, we had uh, uh, Ray Khan and uh, the late Jerry Bird just recently mm -hmm. for a steel guitar, Kelo Oed. And many of our steel guitar players found the beginning. So the luminaries were yeah, all in their teaching. Were all in their teaching. Wow. And we had, I had 13 teachers under me. Wow. At Hello Mele, and uh, we 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 went all the way until about 80, 1982. Then somehow I don't know what happened to Hawaiian Music Foundation, but I continued it. But 1980, the young men who were graduating from we now Pio said, "Well, we want to continue to dance," and so that's where it grew. Then uh, to 1980, Nahanona or and that was the beginning of the halal. We celebrate 25 years this year. My goodness, I know, quarter so. century. Oh, yeah. Doesn't seem possible. And if you had told me, you and I have known each other for a long time, if you told me earlier that this was all because of 25 football players, I would have thought you were 45, 45 football, football I, I would have thought you were kidding me. Oh. I, I, yeah, yeah, I thought they were kidding when they came <laughs> to me. You know, and I said, but no, they were serious. That's wonderful. And it was it was magnificent. I 
could not believe it. So 1972, back to where I was going, I was supposed to nick me that year. But that was the year that we decided that we were going on a concert tour off the mainland. Wow. Southern California and Northern California. We got so many invitations because we had played host to many schools. Mm -hmm. So Mike, Auntie Mikey gave me the option. Well, you either concert tour or you uniki. <laughs> and I thought, and I thought, and I thought, why not get paid for? The other I pay. No, <laughs> I gave it. <laughs> so, well, you know, I said, I, one is I'm, I'm dedicated to my kids, so sure. I'm going to, and, you know, and she understood. She understood. Sure. So I never did finish with that first class, yep. but she was always there, and my whole assistant was always there helping the kids and coming up and working and doing concerts together. It wasn't until, oh, God, 11 years later that I finally finished. <laughs> Amazing. An 11 year long concert tour. I, let me tell you, that was the longest, uh, and there was the longest journey, but I think it was meant to be because from 1968 all the way up to the time of her passing, I became a student of Auntie Edith Kanahori. Ooh, wow. What a privilege. And enchanting, you know, and yeah. all of a sudden I started recalling. And I said, oh, I know these, I've heard these, you know, and then I, I said, I've got to learn it again, mm -hmm. you know, and it. It was easy for me, and it was silent chanting. And then uh, when she passed away, then of course, Auntie Mike told me this in 80, 82, 80, 80, end of 81, I think it's about time you come and finish. <laughs> and I said, this has been almost a 20 year long process of studying. And she says, yeah, you've studied now. So you're celebrating 25 years this year for your halal of teaching hula? I'm yeah. teaching, well, no, I've been teaching since 1962. Okay, 25 yeah. years for, uh, years for, years for the yeah. for the halal. For the halal, And yeah. you've been teaching hula and oli, chanting, for many years also. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things you've done that's very, very special is that you have passed all of that knowledge down to your students, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I can say so, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So that after you, they can continue teaching the generations that come to them. Very much so. Yeah, They're very it's really much so. And many of them are very much involved. They're involved in the immersion program. Mm -hmm. They're involved with Oklahoma. Yeah. They're involved with, at Makuku Okalani here teaching in yeah. the, and uh, at, as, as well as University of Hawaii Hilo and uh, Maui and even my own daughter and, and my, my adopted son, they have their own halau on Maui, too. Kumu, how many, I'm going to ask you a question here. How <laughs> many students, how many people do you think you have taught over the years? Huh. In regards to Hawaiian, from things dealing with Hawaii? Things well, dealing with Hawaiian. No matter I have this, I'm going to take, oh, God. Well, you just picture about a year, at least on an average, per year of from 1966 on solid, I know, that at least I had 90 kids, and every year the average of 100 to 200 kids per year. So we're talking 2,500, 3,000 students. Or more, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Wow. Or more, yeah. That's amazing. Come on, we have about a minute left. Sure. I wanted to ask you, you know, some of our viewers may be watching the program here today and saying, well, you know, I mean, he's been at it many years. He's one of Hawaii's living treasures. He, his knowledge is immense, and I got to tell you, I too am in awe <laughs> of your knowledge. But they may be saying, well, I'm a little old me. I, I mean, I, I don't know what I could do. What message would you have for them? Ah, uh, you know, I asked my question when I was, was, I was thrown in the gauntlet, you know, that first time. I said, yes. yeah, teach on it. The same question, you know, I can pose everything out. Even today, I'm still a learner. You, 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 you come across things and you say, oh, I'd like to do that. But I think everybody has his own kuriana or responsibility to do, whatever it may be. It became language, food, and music, and then many things, and then chant. And um, the, 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 not, it, there's a challenge. There's an old, there's, a, there's an ole no eel. And the ole, the ole no eel literally said, <clears throat> Well, actually, there's two. It says, It's, It says, I dare you to dance, otherwise stay at home. Mm -hmm. And I literally translated, I dare you to take up 
if you want to put it but I, the sword and continue in conquest things. Each of us have some some value that we have, that we possess, that makes us remember what we had and what we were. And that way vai, you know, that when we identify ourselves with a thing in the past, you say, where is it? How come I don't have it? Can I get it back? As soon as you start thinking that way, then you're on the road and say, let's, just, let's do something for it. If it's your own personal wealth and development, go do it. Mm. Don't sit back and say, well, I don't have to do anything. But all of a sudden, it's, it's like something affects you, then you affect, you get affected, then you start to effect. Others. Others. Yes. By doing it. And then you find, ah, oh, we can do this, we can do this. It's that whole question today. We take a look at where chanting has come. It was frowned upon because many times you would talk to the elders. Oh, I didn't come here, Mamu, and no white jack. You know, have Mahana. It's pagan things. You don't chant it, man. But then when you translate the chant to them and you sing the chant or you say the translation to this, and they say, Oh, is that what he says? And I said, Yeah. I said, The thing that was so poor in the past is that things that were so rich that they threw the child out with the bathwater when they changed yes. our cultural definition of things. But in regards to understanding the Creator in our own Hawaiian way, they recognize the existence of God. So as a result, we have more young people looking to language, more young people. Oh, the beauty of chant is grown. Look at Marimana. Yes. Yeah. Before you saw the Kumu chanted, then the students danced in. Now, students are doing a melehuna in before, and some call it holy, and they only out. And now you have young men chanting their genealogy. Wow. Which means there is a birth, a rebirth of Hawaiian oratory. Wow. Kumu, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show uh -oh. today. Mahalo piha for everything you've done for the people, for the culture, your enormous contribution. Like I said, I'm just, I'm in awe of it. And it's an honor to have you here with us today. Well, you know, again, thank you. If there's much to be done, and I think all, all our people are. Yes. If there's a little thing that you said that makes you feel Hawaiian, go we'll look for it. Uh, and if you still have it, hang on to it and share it. Wonderful, wonderful. This has been Voices of Truth, one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future, brought to you by the Kiwani Foundation. Thank you for being with us. I'm Ehuke Kahu Cardwell, and until next time, ahui ho!